Hello, and welcome to the Catching the Octopus podcast. Here, we will explore how connecting inward gives us an advantage outward. We openly talk about the obstacles and challenges and difficulties that life throws our way and how they become moments of gratitude and things that can benefit us when we look back on our lives. I'm your host, Naomi Hurley, and it is my mission to bring you top quality guests that will share with you openly their obstacles and also the techniques they use to go inward that strengthens the way that they serve themselves and others at the highest level. Thank you for joining. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. Today is a recap episode. Thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to talk and recover and recap the episode with Rachel Stravelli. So in that episode, we actually spoke about intuitive decision making in leadership. And one of the key elements is in that is is connecting really with self when we're making decisions and strengthening that intuitive connection so that when we do go into a decision making process we're using more than just the logical mind and the logical mind is essential in us being able to make decisions you know we still need to tap into that we need to have a look at the facts and the figures and you know, what are the risks and the outcomes and all of those sorts of things. But when we can tap in as well to that intuitive side, we get a little bit extra information that we're able to make a decision based on that isn't reliant on just the goings and the happenings, but really more in the doings and where we need to be. So Rachel Um, followed her own curiosity, leading her into a role of being a growth coach. So she is, you know, has used this process in making decisions based around her career, as well as just the everyday things in life. And, and I did the same. So I was, as you know, had a corporate background in HR and safety, and I'd worked really hard to establish myself with a really good reputation in that role and in the industry I was in. And, you know, even when I first left my corporate role, I was approached by some of the competitors to say, hey, will you come and work for me? And I was kind of like, no, but the whole idea of what I was leaving that role I was in was to create my own business and create a change for myself. And intuitively, I knew that that was the right thing to do. And, you know, I looked at all the facts and the figures and if I'm being honest, some of those should have led me to go back and get a day job, right? Because it was a really big change to make. There was a lot of uncertainty that I had to go through, but I knew so strongly that it was what I was supposed to do and what I was meant to do that I followed that. Now, with intuitive decisions, sometimes it may seem like it's the wrong decision. And this can be really tricky to navigate, right? So when we tap into our intuition and we go, right, I'm going to go with option A, that's the right option to go with. Sometimes going with option A may not actually get us where we expected to be, but that doesn't mean it was the wrong decision, right? I have spent my life just, you know, having these big dreams and big goals and I followed them and followed different paths to get me there. <laughs> but if I'm being honest, I haven't always ended up at the A game, end game rather that I thought I was going to end up at because some of those things that I was following took me in different paths. Let me give you an example. When I first studied, started studying psychology, my plan was to be a clinical psychologist. Um, At first it wasn't though, right? My first, my plan was I just wanted to do some extra study. What can I study? So I went to the director of the company I was working in and going, look, I'm thinking of doing some more tertiary study. Is there anything in particular you think would be beneficial for the business? Would you like me to study um, going more down that safety path? Because I was um, establishing my career in safety. I kind of would like to do psychology, but I'm not completely sold yet. And bless the director, he kind of said, do what you want to do, which was a really great piece of advice. And so I chose the psychology, still thinking that it was going to support my role in HR and safety, right? Because the more I understood people, 
the more I was going to be better able to serve them. So a couple of years into that degree was when I decided that I wanted to go and serve people at that different level. And I was looking at the clinical psychology path. So um, coming through, my plan was to, you know, establish it as a side business and then sort of come into that a little bit more. To get to that clinical psych space was another, I think, four years study on top of my degree, including placements, all of that, had it all planned out. And then I stumbled across RTT. So I went and did the rapid transformational training and that changed my scope altogether. Now, would I have done that rapid transformational therapy training if I hadn't have done the psychology degree? Highly likely I wouldn't have. So my decision to go and do that degree, although it didn't get me to that clinical psychologist end game, it still got me to the right door that I needed to walk through next. So sometimes we need to actually just sit in that a little bit and go, well, hang on, I made this decision because I thought this was going to be the outcome, but maybe that wasn't the intended outcome after all. And some things we just don't know, right? You don't know what you don't know. So following her own curiosity led Rachel going to that growth coach space and she has been able to now step in and help other people tap into their intuitive side, right? And and also she uses intuitive guidance to be able to help coach people because some people's intuitive connection isn't as strong as others. And I, I know where she's coming from there because there's some clients that I have, both in the corporate space and the individual space, that I feel I'm giving um, information either in a program or in an individual session that isn't always the way I would have delivered it. And, you know, that's how intuition plays out. Intuition plays out for a bigger purpose. So she had great joy coming from watching people um, owning their own achievements. And I really loved that. And I love the connection that it went back into for leaders because there's so many leaders there that think that they're the star of the show, right? Right. And they're wanting to make sure that they're having a presence and they're having the effects they want to have and and getting notoriety for that and recognition for that. But the real purpose of a leader or a coach is to be able to create that greatness in others. And when we create the greatness in others, then they are able to jump up and be the star of the show. And when we help others to show up as the star of their own show, then we've done our job. And if we've done it well enough, they won't even give us credit and recognition because they know that they've done the work, right? They feel like it's been their decisions and their process and their growth that's helped them show up the way that they show up. And so it's a little bit of a, um, you know, an oxymoron, I suppose, in that the be- if you are able to help people on a really deep level, the more successful you are at that, the less recognition you get for it, which totally goes against everything in that whole patriarchal system of having to win, having to be the best, having to be recognized, having to um, show up and get credit for all those sorts of things. So basically, in summary, your job as a leader is to make other people shine. And ultimately, it's not even about you. It's really about them. So in my conversation with Rachel, we also went and spoke a little bit about emotions and how emotions can be information. And I've spent most of my life ignoring my emotions or um, not probably ignoring them, but pushing them aside and just getting on with it, right? I had, I use my will a lot more than anything else and it served me well. I'm, I'm not going to discredit that. Um, it helped me get to where I am now. But it's only just recently that I've recognized this emotions as information kind of piece and become curious and really started some self-inquiry in that. And, you know, you can do that solo. You can do it with a therapist, a coach. You can do it through journaling. You can do it in, you know, meditation. You can reach out to me or to Rachel. And, you know, if you got something that's niggling at you, then that's the biggest indicator that there's something that you can self-inquire about. We often not have, we don't often rather have 
that awareness of moving and shifting into spaces that are uncomfortable and that are unfamiliar to us. And so we will just keep motoring on with the things that we've learned throughout our upbringings and through our early teens and and early adulthood and keep in that place. And when we do, though, we can become stuck because we're not learning those new ways to process and grow. And using emotions as information has been pivotal in upgrading me to the next level. And it wasn't comfortable. At Sometimes it didn't even feel nice. It was really unfamiliar for me because I would only ever let myself feel good emotions. Any of those bad emotions I thought was like, nope, they don't exist, push on, move on, ignore them. And I missed out on so much. So moving into that place of self-inquiry, um, we then can start becoming more comfortable with who we are because we can start understanding who we are better. We can show up better as we strengthen our connection with our own intuition as well in that space. And life is going to throw things our way all the time. And even as I say, I wouldn't have leveled up to where I am, doesn't make me immune to life's challenges, right? They still come throwing and still come knocking on the door. And um, and sometimes you can't even have a choice whether you're going to answer the door or not, right? They just come barging through. So being challenged is not a one-time thing, you know. Um, self-inquiry and self-growth is not a, oh, I've done it. Oh, cool, I can get on to the next thing. It's not how it works. So we just have to realize that and know that life's going to keep showing up and life's going to keep throwing things our way. And that whole self-inquiry and personal growth and development of intuition is an ongoing process. And even when we've got to a point where we've got really strong intuition, there is going to be things that our intuition doesn't make us aware of. And we're only given the information that we need. So a bit of a left field example, but if you went and saw a clairvoyant right, and went for a clairvoyant reading, that clairvoyant can only see the things that you're meant to be told. So they're not going to see the lotto numbers, much to people's disbelief. Oh, if you're a psychic, you'd see the lotto numbers. Not if you're not meant to, right? Because there's this higher space at play, you know, this intuition, this information comes from ourselves, but that's also channeled down to us from a higher place. And it's like, you know, with your children, you're not going to give them everything. You're only going to tell them what they need to know. And so that's kind of us as we mosey on through this thing called life. So some ways you can strengthen your intuition kind of through meditation. I mean, that's the way that I've been able to do it. Um, journaling, um, through your dreams, recognition of those, through tapping into your emotions and that self-inquiry can also strengthen your intuition. Um, you can also do the different courses and programs if that's of interest to you as well. And I know I've done quite a few of them. I've um, done mediumship development courses that I didn't think I'd be really good at. Um, and I'm not, I'm not a spirit medium. I'm not great at speaking with um, dead people and spirits, but I was surprised at some of the information that came through in that space. And it got me curious. So I did a course um, with a gentleman named Anthony Griselka, who is um, a local spirit medium here where I live. Um, he's also, I think Australia's ghost whisperer is one of his brandings. And He's amazing. He's very good at what he does. And so he ran a program and I remember saying to him, oh, should I come along? Like I'm not, I know I'm not a medium and I know I don't have those abilities. And he kind of said, well, you know what, if you thought if you're interested in tennis and you thought that that would be fun, look, your coach might not get you to Wimbledon, but doesn't mean you can't have a hack around game. I'm like, well, I like that analogy. I'll sign up. So I did the program with him. And look, yes, I had some hits. It was like kind of, um, oh, there was someone, people came in with photos and things and we did readings for them. I was like, oh, yeah, you got a relative named John. And they're like, yeah. And my head's going, yeah, well, most people have a relative named John, right? So um, I did it and I sat in it and I did the exercises. But the the pivotal moment that I realized there was something bigger than me going on was our last session. So Anthony got in a group of volunteers. I think there was about 10 or 15 people in the room. 
And then one by one, we came in and stood in front of the room and did like those little readings, you know, you see um, stage readings that mediums do. So I was the second person um, to come in. There was a, we were a group of 10 and I did the reading and I was like, oh, there's someone here that's got a family member named Mary over that side of the room. And there was some Italians in the room going, yeah, that's us. And I kind of looked at Anthony with this look like really, and he's egged me to go on. So then I picked up someone had lost a child in the room, which um, probably isn't unrealistic for the number of people that were there. Um, and then some other emotional things and ra di ra di ra right? So probably all that for about five minutes was just saying stuff that just popped into my head. And if I'm being quite honest, I just thought it was random stuff popping into my head. I, I didn't actually feel that they're the connection. And, and I've realized now that that's how I operate when I get things. And now I, it's very, it's so subtle that I couldn't realize it at the time, but the more I tune into it, the more now I'm actually like, Oh, hang on. That wasn't my thought or that wasn't my idea. So anyway, where I'm going with this story. So the next, I sit down and the next person comes out and, and as we did the readings, everyone had to wait in another room, right. That was in the course. And then we just came out one by one, but then we could sit in with the group and watch. And the next person came out, picked up Mary, picked up a, a lost child, picked up pretty much the same stuff I did. It delivered it in a different way, but picked it up and I went, Oh, that's interesting. And then the next person, same thing and the next person, and the next person, and all of the people after me, you know, they had a little bit of different information from time to time, but they all picked up on the same things that I said, and my mind was blown, and the only thing I could think of was there's something here that I don't know and I don't understand, and I want to. And I'll be honest, that was a really big spark in my curiosity for learning more about energy and how energy worked and how we could tap into that because it, it obviously existed. Like I saw it and from a place of, I, I wouldn't say I was a um, skeptic because I definitely believed in that spiritual element, but I didn't have the belief that that was possible. And so I tapped into my curiosity and started working on strengthening that intuition and strengthening those skills. And the thing is we've all got them. We've all had that space where we know the phone's going to ring and it rings or we're thinking of someone and then they call or we go to text someone and they're texting us at the same time. Like we've all got an intuitive element to us. It's just that sometimes we don't actually realize that we can use that and it's a superpower we can use for good. If you're enjoying this podcast and you want Naomi or any of her guests featured on your podcast or as a keynote speaker at your next event, you'll find their contact details included in the show notes. If you'd like to learn more about how you can work with Naomi individually or as part of your strategy to improve leadership in your business, then review the courses, offers and services at getupandgrowconsulting.com.au. And so, as I said before, though, we don't want to cut out the logical mind, though. This isn't about just leading from a place of, oh, I've got a gut feeling, although gut feelings are valid. I don't want to invalidate them. But we also need more information because we're still humans, right? We're humans or we're spiritual beings coming here for a human existence. So we still operate within that human existence. And I think that's why it's been so important for me to go and do my tertiary study and study that psychological science and all those sorts of things, because I want to know how it all connects and works together. Haven't figured it out yet, um, but maybe one day, maybe I will, maybe I won't. But that logical mind um, is still important. And Rachel used a really great analogy that I wanted to reshare with you here. And that was like the logical mind coming in as the data scientist, right? Bringing in the data, having done the research and having all of those in that information there that is able to be used. And then you've got the HR person, which is all about honing in on relationships, how people feel, connecting with that um, empathy empathetic side of really understanding people and how they operate. And then you've got the creative director or your marketing manager, right, that comes up with the creativity and the resourcefulness. And, and when we put all three of those in a room together, then we can get better solutions to our problems, right? And we all have those parts inside of us. 
we all have the logical mind. We all have the empathetic nature. We all have that intuitive or creative side. And when we use all of them for when we make decisions, that's when our decisions are more rock solid. So Rachel went on to say that you can develop your intuition just as much as you can develop your logical mind. And I just gave you a bit of an example of one of the things I did um, that helped me realize I had intuition, Um, but also just little things that you can do to develop that creates and strengthens it. And, you know, there's little, you can probably Google a whole heap of little tricks and hacks and things like that. But I feel like sitting in silence is a really good way, which is kind of another word for meditation. Um, There's other things you can do, predicting little things as they come up um, and just be playful with it. Become curious about it. I think because we can't see it and touch it and it's not tangible, sometimes there's some fear attached to it and it's about removing the fear and just playing with it. Are we going to be a hundred percent right all the time? Probably not, but Do you hit 100% of your tennis shots all the time? Probably not. It's just about getting in and having a bit of fun. And the more we do anything, the more we strengthen that muscle. And so the more we actually connect intuitively and use that intuition, the stronger it's going to get. And you may be like me. You may not even feel your intuition coming through. You may not even realize, but after a while, you will. You'll start sensing it, especially if it's as subtle as what it is in me. Um, you know, I've I even look back at my life and I'm like, oh, it's so interesting. So when I was about 18, I remember just sitting down talking with some friends and we're talking about goals. And I'm like, you know, when I'm 25, I'm gonna own my own home and then I'm gonna have a kid when I'm 26. I hadn't even met the father of my child at that point. Um, turns out. I moved into my own home that I purchased just after I turned 25 and Bryce was born a couple of months after my 26th birthday. So some may say I actually made that happen, right? Because I put that goal out, I made it happen. 99% probably correct. But also at 18, why was that even coming into my head? You know, if I get curious, maybe it was a little bit of both. Maybe intuitively, I kind of knew that that's where I should be. And so what that did is set me up to use that logical mind and those resources to be able to get me to that point. So there's this like little balance and little dance between those two things that can help us achieve and get us to where we need to be in life and and for our purpose of what we want to do here. So Rachel also connected that intuitive side to creativity because it's kind of boundless. And she said keeping connected to intuition and keeping creative side flowing can then help us shift and pivot when we need to because we, as the human side of us, definitely like structure and what's familiar. And so when we're actually just in the logical mind, we'll find all the reasons for and all the reasons against something that doesn't fit with or does fit where we need to be or want to be. Whereas when we keep connected to the intuition, that can give us a little bit more flexibility. You know, we don't have to be rigidly fixed into that mindset of it needs to be this way or it doesn't happen at all, you know, like my way or the highway. Like the intuition can then come in and go, well, does it? But what if we just tweak this? Oh, why don't you try that? And it allows us to be a bit more creative with things and come through. Um, so one of the biggest steps though, coming into this space is really being courageous and being courageous is stepping into your true self. It's not an easy journey for most, right? There's things that we experience during our lifetime that sometimes we purposely push down that we don't want to bring back up, that we don't want to process, but you know, it's scary as well to think that others may judge things within us that we haven't shown others previously. You know, this is very relevant to me. I I worked in corporate in logical roles for such a long time and I downplayed my intuitive nature a lot because it didn't fit in in the culture that I was working within. And then stepping into my own business, um, some of you, if you knew me when I first did that, may remember that I never used the word hypnosis or hypnotherapy, I always talked about, you know, it's a meditative state. I take people into to process their emotions. 
Like, why did I do that? Purely because I wasn't comfortable showing that side of myself for that fear of judgment from those other people because that group in that culture that didn't support the spiritual elements, like that was my tribe, that they were the people that I connected with. And as social beings, we can grip onto that too tightly. What I didn't realize was that by stepping into myself, by having the courage to show up who I truly am as who I truly am, that courage to just be me, that actually then created connections in a whole new tribe. You know, obviously don't go spruiking off about all of my spiritual stuff in all of the environments I'm in because I do know that some people don't have that same curiosity and some people have a lot of apprehension towards it. But I don't hold back on who I am at the same time. So I will still openly say now when people say, what do you do? I say, oh, I'm a human behavior specialist and a hypnotherapist. And then if they disconnect from me, they disconnect from me. If they become curious, I then start engaging with them. And some people it's just like, oh, yeah, doesn't even phase them. But that fear from me that I would be judged and rejected by everyone was false. It was just because that was the environment that I'd spent so much time in. So it's really important as well to connect in with that self because, you know, not only does it help us make decisions, but it also helps as a guiding beacon for us on where we need to be and where we should be. And this has been so evident for me. You know, I, I, you know, just keep walking and if I find a door that's open or if I find a door rather, I then check in and see whether I should open it or not. And the doors I'm meant to walk through, I get to walk through. And that brings a lot of joy to me in that space. So Rachel also said that many years of following your intuition will give you the courage to do it. So the more you do it, the more familiar it becomes. And it'll also give you stronger guidance that you can rely on. Right. And as I mentioned, you know, the more we tap in, the more we can realize when it's present and when it's there. And then we can have that awareness. And we still do need to process things logically, look at the pros and cons, but it should complement our decision making. Either one of those shouldn't be the only silo. We shouldn't just be going logical and we shouldn't just be going intuition. We need to guide them both in. That's what the human existence is about. And connecting, uh, using that analogy that Rachel had, connecting that scientist, the HR and the marketing director to really come in and create those effective decisions. We did touch a little bit on the fear of intuition and sometimes intuition giving us information that we don't really want. And the example that Rachel used was around relationships or situations that we're in. And she's come across many people that have had fear of developing their intuition because they've been scared it's going to tell them to leave a relationship or to leave their current job or to make big changes in their life that they're not really ready to make. Now, she also mentioned that if you're fearful of that, then there's usually a reason you're fearful of that, right? And that doesn't mean you should leave those situations, but what it does mean is it's time to become curious. Like, why do you feel like it might tell you you're going to leave your relationship? Is it because the relationship's not serving you? Okay, why isn't the relationship serving you? Is it because you're not showing up authentically? Or is it because you've lost that spark? Or is it because you haven't been giving and sharing? Or is it because you're not receiving what you want to receive? And so the key isn't just to leave. Right? The key is to go in and start unpacking that more and become more curious about it and do that self-inquiry. How can I contribute to this better? What can I do differently that might create change in this situation? Experiment. Test it out. You know, Rachel said, you know, if you leave a relationship without doing the work, you'll end up in a new relationship with the same problems. Same goes for the workplace. If you're a leader and you're not happy in the position that you're in for any particular reason, you shouldn't just go and quit and go get another job because you'll end up in that same situation. 
Because what we don't realize is wherever we show up, we're bringing 50% of us to every environment. We're sorry, we're bringing all of us, but it's contributing to the 50% of the makeup of the environment. And so if we don't work on that part of us that's showing up, then we're going to incite those same behaviors, those same reactions, those same triggers with the people around us. We're going to be attracting the same environment. We're going to be looking for a job in a similar um, situation with a similar boss, with similar co-workers. So when we change up ourselves, then we can change our future. So it doesn't mean just running. It means becoming curious and coming into those um, inquiry spaces. Um, we also talked about why well, I, I kind of brought up, you should never make a decision drunk. And I got that um, quote from my psychologist many years ago. Um, and that doesn't mean alcohol, doesn't mean being drunk on alcohol or drugs or anything. But what that means is by being affected by emotion. And so when we make a decision, we need to make sure that we're showing up to that decision with clarity. An emotion, whether it's a heightened emotion or whether it's a lower emotion, whether it's happiness and excitement, whether it's sadness and frustration and anger, they're not true indicators. Like they're not allowing us to tune into ourselves in a strong way. So we're being influenced by those emotions in the decision-making. And I don't know if anyone's been to a Tony Robbins event, right? He's very good at this. He gets people's emotions heightened, everyone's excited, and then he drops a program and majority of people go and enroll in that program. Um, I was one of them. I enrolled in Business Mastery. Oh, it was the Mastery University, I think he called it. So it was Business Mastery, oh, sorry, Life Mastery and Wealth Mastery. Um, and I ended up doing Business Mastery and then pulled out of the other ones because um, I didn't feel like it would suit me. But at the time I was all in. Yes, we're going to do this because of my emotions, right? So what we want to do though is when we're making a decision, if we want to make a decision that can really tune in to that intuitive side of us is take time out, take the time to pause, reflect, and just listen to what our intuition is showing us. So I we talked a couple of examples that I kind of use, um, and especially with my kids and stuff like that and helping guide them with decisions is sitting in the decision and seeing how your body responds. So saying to yourself, oh, should I stay in this situation? How does your body respond? Now, sometimes it's that subtle that we don't even notice that it's responded. So we also need to ask the alternate question as well. What happens if I don't leave and see how the body responds? And then we can use that information. It's kind of like using the data then that the logical mind can still come in and go, okay, here's the pros, here's the cons, here's what the intuitive said. Okay, now I'm going to make a decision that is more educated and more holistic. Um, we also talked about flipping coins as decision-making tools. Um, and I know some people flip a coin and they go by the coin I, I'm, if that's the way you want to roll or the way you want to flip, um, you go ahead and do that. But the coin flipping for me was a little bit different. So I noticed that if I flipped a coin, so say I was had option A and option B, I couldn't decide which one. Intuition wasn't giving me anything, so let's go to coin flipping. And you probably wouldn't coin flip on big major decisions either, disclaimer there, right? Um, so flip the coin and then it goes, oh, yeah, we've got it. It says option A. And then you can feel in your body go, oh, I really wanted option B. So the coin flip wasn't making the decision, but the coin flip can help us tap into ourselves a little bit deeper. And then we can make decision B. So there's so many elements that go into decision making and intuitiveness is only just one part. And I don't recommend making decisions based purely on intuition um, because there's so many elements that we need to consider when we're in this space. And sometimes we need to make decisions as well that may not be popular, that other people may not like. But if we've done that due diligence on looking at the logical mind, looking at the pros and cons, looking at the facts and figures, and we've tapped in intuitively and everything's pointing in a direction, then sometimes we need to make those decisions. And that's what leadership's about. Leadership's ma about making decisions for the greater good, making the best decisions with what we have at the time. And 
Another thing I just wanted to touch on is any decision you make was the right decision at that point in time with the information you had. And even if later on down the track you're like, oh, I kind of should have made that other decision because these would have been different outcomes, there's no point going back and beating yourself up, right? All you can do is go, okay, well, what can I learn from that process? How can I do that differently next time? Do I need to tap in a bit more intuitively? Do I need to get more research to help me with a decision? Do I need to collaborate with more people in the workplace to get different perspectives that can help me with my decision making as well? So there was a lot of content that we covered. It was um, a really great episode. And if you haven't listened to it, obviously go back and listen to the full interview because Rachel has some really great content that she shared with us um, in the discussion. Um, Thank you to Rachel again, if you're listening to this, for jumping on. And if you want to reach out with to her, you can obviously find all of her contacts in the show notes from the last episode. But if you have any questions about this or you want to dive a little bit deeper and you're not sure where to go or how to start, feel free to reach out. Um, You can either send me an email or you can pop it in the comments below the podcast. And um, I do check them from time to time and I'd be happy to help you out. So thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. And I hope you got value out of this episode. Thanks for joining in and listening to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. It's been great having you here. And if you'd like to go and like and subscribe and maybe even leave a five-star rating if you think it's worth it, I'd really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you in our